Hey everybody, tonight's video is called Hope and Come in Judgment, and tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Isaiah, where we're going to be looking at the hope for Israel as well as the come in judgment on the northern kingdom. And so Isaiah chapter 9, it's a very popular passage that we go through at Christmas time often, just like chapter 7, as it's a messianic prophecy. And so we'll kick it off right here. Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So the northern border in northeast Galilee, west of the Jordan River, lied Zebulon and Naphtali. And they were the first to suffer from the invasion of the Assyrian king, as seen back in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. And this was the marking of the beginning of the dark days for Israel. And at first, we see that the days were to be full of gloom. But afterward, God was going to transform that gloom into horror or honor. And uh, the coming of the Messiah is synonymous with the coming of light to remove the darkness of captivity. And the gloom carried over from the last chapter. And the northern kingdom tribes, they were the first to suffer from the Assyrian invasions. So in God's mercy, they will be the first to see the hope, the Messiah's light. And verse 3 through 5 says, You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rode in blood will be used for burning and fire, fuel of fire. So once again, we see that the Lord confirmed his covenant with Abraham to multiply his physical descendants as Genesis 22 verse 17 describes as the sands of the seashore. And eventually, the Lord will flee national Israel from bondage to Assyria, Babylon, and every other foreign power that has oppressed her. And we see the terms such as yoke, staff. And these are all figures used for oppression. And Day of Midian, verse 4, speaks of Gideon's defeat of the Midianites, which was accomplished by God's mighty power in spite of... Gideon's own weakness, as seen in Judges chapter 6, verse 7, and Judges chapter uh, 7. And the world will no longer need the accessories of warfare because a time of universal peace will follow the return of Christ. And, you know, for premillennialists, they believe in a literal millennialism where Christ is going to come down and rule over all the nations for a literal 1,000 years. And the debris left from battle can be removed and burned when the fighting stops. And God will bring an end to war. And these verses, as I've said many times, are highly debated among many people in eschatology who have different viewpoints on the millennium. In verse 6, the common Christmas verse that we go through every year. For unto us a child is born, unto, a, uh, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So notice in the first couple lines of verse 6, we see child and son. And child and son we need to go back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it says here, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So what we see in verse 6 here, child and son, it's pointing to Emmanuel, God with us. The child to be born of the virgin that we read in chapter 7, verse 14. And in verse 7, we're going to see the child is of royalty along King David, with rights to the Davidic throne. And we see different descriptions here of government. And the government, the son will rule over the nations of the world. He will be king over all the world. And wonderful counselor is the provider of divine wisdom. Mighty God is a powerful warrior who will accomplish the military exploits that are mentioned in verses 3 through 5. An everlasting father, that is a very controversial title, and it's debated among author profession, profession believers who don't hold to the Trinity doctrine viewpoint in the Godhead. An everlasting father, the Messiah will be a father to his people eternally, and as King David, uh, as David a king, he will compassionately care for and discipline them and then we see the prince of peace and we're going to come right back to everlasting father to discuss it more but prince of peace the government of Emmanuel, will procure and pro perpetuate peace among the nations of the world you see the prophecy in verse six he's going to protect his people and to note as i mentioned we're going to go right back to talking about everlasting father it does not teach in my understanding of scripture it does not confirm or you know it doesn't prove modalism as a true doctrine modalism has been rebuked by early church you know scholars and modalism is what we hear more of today called usually oneness doctrine oneness pentecostalism as a main part and basically, they teach that Jesus is schizophrenic, that Jesus is the Holy Spirit and Father. And the problem that you run into with that belief, that Jesus is all three and just playing different modes. When you come to the baptism, then you have Jesus speaking to himself in the sky and seeing himself and all that. And it just doesn't wrap up. So Jesus is not putting on different modes as some would argue, and they would argue against me that the Trinity is a false doctrine because they cannot comprehend how you can have a Godhead, three distinct persons, as one God. And ancient kings often refer to themselves as fathers of their subjects or people. So, fathers was a ancient term that would refer to someone that was a leader over a group of people and you know so jesus is everlasting father jesus is king and this wonderful verse commonly quoted at christmas time is a wonderful glorious prophecy on the coming birth of the messiah and jesus would be a man not an angel we should realize that of verse six and the child had to be born the child wasn't created and he didn't come as a fully grown man. He didn't just fall out of a basket, you know, as a fully grown man. He, he would be more than just a man. He was also the eternal son of God, the second person of the Godhead. And Jesus had to be given as he is eternal and he has existed forever as the son before adding humanity to his deity. And Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if Jesus wasn't fully man, he couldn't have stood in place of sinful man and be the substitute for the punishment uh, that man deserves. And if he weren't fully God, his sacrifice would have been insufficient. And if Jesus isn't fully God and fully man, we are lost in our sin because then that proves that the Bible is not true. In verse 6 is not literal names of the Messiah, but they are aspects of his character. So when we see all these different titles, the government, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, these are all characteristics of him. 
and they describe who he is and what he has come to do. In verse 7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so the virgin son will be the rightful heir to David's throne and inherit the promises of the Davidic covenant as we saw back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. And the Messiah, he will rule for all eternity and for premillennialists, the literal 1,000-year reign is just a special aspect. And this is a fulfillment of God's great covenant with David. In the chapter, we see it moves into four parts coming up into chapter 10, verse 4. And we're going to finish today into chapter 10. So we're going to read the first four verses of chapter 10 before the video ends. And you might be like, why would you break into another chapter and then leave, you know, 28 verses after by themselves. And that's because when the Bible was written, translated into English, there wasn't numbering in the Bible. There weren't chapters or any of that. So the Bible was all one writing. And, you know, the section of verses one through four that we have broken up, it flows much better with chapter nine. And you'll see that. So known as the speech of the outstretched hands is what the chapter moves into the four parts. And it's going to tell us of the great warning calamity sent by the Lord that have gone unheeded by Israel. And we see that God will judge Israel in its capital Samaria. And as mentioned before, the northern kingdom is sometimes referred to as a frame in scripture. And so we'll continue moving along right here. We're going to look at verses 8 through 12 for the first part. It says, The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know a frame in the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against them, and spur his enemies on. The Assyrians before the Philistines and the Philistines behind. And they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So the Lord brought a word against all his people. And we see Israel's downfall was her failing of self sufficiency, like, I got this whereby she thought she could handle any eventuality. And they, glorif they glorified themselves. And the people think that the challenges they face are just minor setbacks rather than being the beginning of the end. And they imagine that they're going to start rebuilding with better materials when in reality destruction lies ahead. And in verse 11, the Syrian king's enemies were the Assyrians. In verse 12, the outstretched hand will punish beyond what the people had already experienced. And that hand that once delivered Israel from the Egyptians is now extended to strike his own people. And their attitude is what we see commonly with non-believers around us. Who cares if God judges us? And the judgment against Israel's pride was not enough. They would... There was still sin to judge, and God wasn't done with his work of judgment. So even though they were filled with pride, God was still going to deal with them. And I just want to make a side comment, Mr. Peckham. You might want to focus on verses 8 to 12 in this video today. And uh, verse 13 through 17 says, For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head, and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day, the elder and honorable, he is the head, the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail, for the leaders of this people causes them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed, therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, 
nor have mercy on the fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evil doer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So if you go into the minor prophet book of Amos chapter 4, it shows that Israel is unresponsive to the divine discipline. And they have not depended on the Lord, they have not sought him. And with due diligence, instead they persisted in their rebellion. And in verse 14, we see head and tail. They represent the civil and religious leadership as explained in verse 15. And the same imagery, including the palm branch and reed, is used to represent the Egyptian leaders in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 15. And the aggravated wickedness of Israel extended to all the classes, including the less fortunate, like the fatherless and the widows, who often were objects of God's special mercy, as we saw back in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. And not even the most helpless of society will escape the judgment of God. And it's amazing to look at Isaiah chapter 1 and compare it here. Because God has a special place, a special care for the widows, the orphans, and all that. And if you were to, if I was to break this down for a Sunday school class, I would say that Israel was like a bunch of dumb animals that resisted even more when they were beaten. And you don't have to call the ASPCA on me. I don't hit animals. All right. Just want to clarify that before. I get, you know, people at my doorstep. It's just an analogy that I'm trying to explain like a, to a five-year-old the way Israel was. And once again, it's a chorus in verse 17 that God had more judgment as there was still sin he had to judge. And then we move into verses 18 through 21, which wraps up chapter 9, but we're not done yet today after this. It says, for wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke, through the wrath of the Lord of hosts. The land is burned up, and the people shall be as a fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand, and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand, and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour a frame, and a frame Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So one thing we must know about sin is that sin is found in every person, and it corrupts everybody's at all of our thoughts and deeds and God's total destruction is just and we must remember that we must remember that when God judges it is just and pride and greed destroy the fibers of society and God's wrath allowed wickedness to cause society to self-destruct and a senseless mutual exploitation resulted and anarchy and confusion. And in verse 21, Manasseh and Ephraim, we see that they engaged in a civil war with one another before in Judges chapter 12, verse 4, and they unite only in their opposition against Judah. And they were the descendants of Joseph's two sons, and their wickedness was like a raging fire. It was like a wildfire. And it's unstoppable, it's swift, uncontrolled, and devouring everything that it touches. And this wildfire of God's judgment is fueled by the people as their wickedness supplies fuel to God's judgment. In verse 21, for the third time, we have the chorus, I call it, that sin was still to be judged and that God wasn't finished with them yet. In a tapping into chapter 10 verse 1 through 4 says woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees who write misfortune which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people the widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless 
What will you do in the day of punishment and the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So, as tapping into verses 1 through 4, we can see that it runs right with the flow of chapter 9. So the prophet returns to the assigned reasons for God's wrath against inequalities, inequities in administrating the laws and harsh treatment of those in need. And we see the principle of retribution is an important biblical teaching. We see that the poor and fatherless are the objects of of the Lord's special care. And in verse 3, the day of punishment can be thought of as the day of the Lord. And the Assyrians were the first to invade, and then Babylon and these other foreign powers followed. And the leaders and the people of Israel were unfair to others, and we see that they, they preyed on the weak. And in verse 4, it repeats the chorus that we've heard three times already, that God wasn't done with them yet, that there was still more sin that God needed to judge. And one thing, you know, as we read verses uh, 18 through verse 4, we should really take note that God's judgment is persistent. And so, to wrap up tonight's video, and I know this is going to be a long video, we're already 22 minutes almost before we're wrapping up right now. Tonight, we look at the hope for Israel. And we see a day of light for the northern tribes. And verse 1 and 2 was fulfilled in the Galilean ministry of Jesus. And I want to go read that in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4 verse 13. It says, or well, we'll start at verse 12. It says, Now when Jesus heard that John had put, been put in the prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region, in shadow of death, light has dawned. So the majority of Jesus' ministry, if you haven't known or haven't studied the Gospels, took place in the northern area of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And God certainly did have a special blessing for this once lightly esteemed land. And in eschatology, some see verse 1 and 2 as being a double prophecy. And I mentioned that term before. And double prophecy simply means that it's a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in two ways. A near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And they see it being ultimately fulfilled at Christ's second coming when the area is freed from the yoke of foreign invaders. And in verse 3 through 5 we see the joy in the Messiah's deliverance and victory. And we know that Jesus has broken the yoke of our burden. And I want to go over to Matthew chapter 11, a few pages over, verse 29 and 30. And it says here, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So one thing we should know about Jesus is his gentleness and humbleness. And we can take his yoke upon us and we can find rest in Christ. And I want to go over to Romans chapter 8 verse 37. So something else that Christ shares with us is in this verse. Romans 8 37 says, and yet all these things we are moved, or sorry, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So in Christ, we share in his victory. He shares the victory with us. 
And in verse 6, we see the popular verse at Christmas time showing the glory of the Messiah that was to come, who will reign. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, so it's going to be a lot of New Testament passages here as well. So we're definitely hitting over a half hour today. Um, we're going to start at verse 5 here through 7. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in in the likeness of men. So in order for Jesus to be able to fully identify with humanity and display in his life the servant nature that's in God, he made himself as a lower servant. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says here, For there is one God, a one mediator between God and man, men, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus, what we should know is that Jesus didn't ascend to heaven and lose his humanity. Jesus remains a man still, eternally. And Jesus did not relinquish his humanity, as I mentioned, at his ascension. But now he is a man in a resurrected body, just as we'll one day have. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31 through 33, another uh, popular area at Christmas time. Luke 1, 31 through 33 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb. And bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy of the one with rights to the Davidic throne. In Revelation 19 verse 15, so when we talk about verse 6, and we see that the government will rest upon his shoulders, we should remember this, Revelation 19, verse 15. says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fairness of, and wrath of the Almighty God. So Jesus will rule the nations of the world. In the next chapter over, chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 4 through 6, says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this will be fulfilled in the millennium when Christ rules the earth as kings of kings and lord of lords in the premillennial view. And the other millennial views is they see Revelation 20 as symbolic or as, you know, like an allegory for meaning a period of time. And, uh, Jesus is mighty God. I want to go back into Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. So at least I'm keeping us right in the book of Revelation here. Uh, but Revelation 1, 8 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus and the revelation of John here, the revelation to John here, the revelation of Jesus Christ, that's what the book of Revelation means. We see that 
Jesus claims he's the Alpha and Omega beginning and the end. And he calls himself the Almighty. So the other thing I want to hit on here once again to reiterate Everlasting Father does not mean Jesus himself is the person of the Father and the Godhead. And in Hebrew, it means that Jesus is the source and author of all eternity. And that Jesus is the creator himself, as we see in Colossians chapter 1. And Jesus makes peace as Prince of Peace, making peace especially between God and man. And I want to go back into the gospel according to Luke chapter 2, verse 14. And we're going to start in verse 13. It says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So peace upon men. And so in Isaiah chapter 9, as we continue our wrap up here, in verse 7 it shows us the glory of the Messiah's reign. And I want to go over to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 and this verse is the genealogy of jesus and it's going to point that he is the son of david and matthew 1 1 says the book of the genealogy of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham and then you get all the different names in the genealogy and jesus genealogy shows lineage from david and so as we move into the latter part of chapter 9, we see verses 8 to 12 starts almost like a poem where it shows because of their unholy pride that Israel will be defeated by her enemies. And verse 13 through 17 shows us because they refuse to repent that there will be an overthrow of leadership. And verse 18 through 21 shows that they will attack their own brothers because of prevailing wickedness. And verse 1 through 4 of the chapter 10 shows that they will be exiled and slain because of social injustice. And we'll see in next is we're going to be looking at God's judgment on the arrogant Assyria. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.